buildings and learning from vernacular and historic built environment. Um, I am really excited to welcome a range of people and experts from all around the world. I, I was going to toss up the number of countries we got represented. It's it's a pretty good, pretty good range. Um, we're going to hear from people very briefly as a series of very short um, as presentations and, and discussion around the points, the idea is to give you a bit of a flavour of the different ways in which the built environment um, relates to local conditions, climate um, and society and think about what that means for the future. So I do hope you enjoy what you're going to hear. I'm going to hand over now to Peter Exley. Peter is the president of the American Institute of Architects. Thank you, um, and thanks to Andrew Potts working on behalf of the Climate Heritage Network for the invitation to this event. I also want to say thank you to all of my colleagues in the room and virtually who fight the good fight, as they say, uh, but in a way that is accessible and relevant. I want to welcome you and set the scene for today's event. The AIA is a proud member of the Climate Heritage Network, which in turn is a member of the Global Alliance for Building and Construction. I don't think I need to connect the dots for you on why our collective work is so urgent and so necessary. I do want to spend a moment or two talking about why our work must be done together. Our historic fabric is perhaps our greatest weapon against the continued degradation of our environment. I agree that the greenest building is probably the one that's already built, as my learned colleague and a former AIA president frequently says. I also believe that architects do our best work when we work as what I call first adapters. In the spirit of the first responders who can quickly and effectively stabilize horrendous and harmful situations, and we're grateful to first responders for their bravery and fortitude, but when architects act as first adapters, we see our foresight and preparation on full display. We see architects' expertise as humans who live in this world and understand things like scale, livability, function, and inspiration. We see architects' expertise as denizens of building information modeling and hundreds of other pieces of software and technology that architects ut utilize as technicians. We see their sense of economy for materials and labor our belief in context as a driver of design, and our belief in design as the driver of conditions that make our homes, schools, plazas, hospitals, libraries, and riverbank redevelopments both lovely and functional. As a Chicago architect, I can tell you how lovely and functional our own riverbank has become after decades and decades of degradation. Chicago is a river city as much as it is a coastal city. And the politics of the river, whichever course it took inbound or outbound, might have been in harmony with economic gain, but hardly ever in harmony with environmental or human health. That is all different now, in large part, because how we have adopted it and adapted it. As I said a minute ago, our historic fabric is perhaps our greatest weapon against the continued degradation of our environment. Not to stretch this metaphor too thinly, but it is my privilege to represent architects who know how to weaponize our historic fabric to adapt to the climate. Of course, I represent architects of all stripes, about 95,000 of them across the world. The good ones spend a lot of time gathering information. The great ones know how to analyze that information. And the truly great ones, and I think actually that's the majority of our 95,000 members, can probe the regional sensibilities and building customs of our vernacular expressions from Appalachia to the American Southwest or to the Wisconsin Prairie. And they do it with humility and compassion, knowing that design is always an intervention and not an ex novo Atlantis or El Dorado. Sometimes architects don't get it right. We know this. 
the architecture, engineering, and construction industry widely specified asbestos during as a building material for 70 years. It took us another decade to recognize its danger and phase it out, at least in the United States. There are hundreds of other examples and all of them serve my point, which is if architects lead with humility and compassion, then everything else that follows will be in the best interests of humanity and the planet. So what can the Climate Heritage Network bring to the Global Alliance for Building and Construction? If you agree that we're our own worst enemy in the Anthropocene, then you agree we must be agents of change. I focused on adaptation in my remarks today. However, there are other aspects of CHN's platform that I would be remiss if I didn't mention, like carbon mitigation, circular economies, improving the communication between climate science and heritage efforts. And as a dimension of what my architecture colleagues call resilience, being realistic about what it means to thrive, planning for loss and working with nature rather than against it. Perhaps that's the best way to leave you today by saying nature isn't the enemy here. We are our own worst enemies. We also hold the key to fixing our problems together. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I think that sets the scene beautifully. Nature isn't the enemy and we hold the key to fixing our problems together. So with that note, I'm going to introduce our first panel um, and we are going to hear first from Ibrahim Chan, who is executive director, um, excuse my French, um, Ibrahim, <laughs> of the Corps des Volontaires Beninois, the Corps of Benin Volunteers. Um, and a Beninese jurist specializing in cultural heritage. He's director and co-founder of the Tata Somba Eco Museum, the first ecological museum in West Africa. Um, Ibrahim, over to you. And I think we need the slides, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Alors, je, je vais parler en, en français. J'espère que la traduction marche et que tout le monde peut, peut comprendre ce que, ce que je vais présenter. <laughs> je suis désolée. Um, we, Unfortunately, we're unable to secure a translator, so we are going to try our best with our pidgin French, and apologies, Ibrahim, but I think Ibrahim, can you? Okay, <laughs> that would be wonderful. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. So uh, I'm trying to make a presentation in English, so excuse my, <laughs> my English, but we can try. So the name of uh, this presentation is uh, the Takenta uh, on Labo... Lab Lab laboratory of um, climate uh, architecture you know because uh, we work with uh, this uh, traditional heritage and uh, next slide please so uh, see this uh, picture I, I choose to start my presentation you can see that uh, this uh, small lady is uh, is looking for the 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 uh, is looking is is in two step uh, in the past and in the future you know and uh, in the past she has uh, in the hand some materials of building because she is uh, participates uh, of uh, some school of learning how to build uh, the Takenta. The Takenta is uh, the the building uh, who is um, the focus of my communication. So in this um, uh, in this community, there is no uh, a, a good, uh, there is no a bad uh, materials to to build. They just we, they just have the the best architect to build. There is no bad materials. They can use every every materials to build the house there's not a bad materials so these children is going to 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 learn how to build with all the materials around his uh, community next slide please and uh, what is takienta takienta means uh, uh, vernacular architecture who is uh, an habitation who is also uh, the place of uh, of um, Cult, 
and uh, the, it's the spirit, spiritual place and also the art work because you can see the the design of these houses is very uh, is very uh, specifical so it's an habitation because people is living on this uh, house is on a cultural or spiritual um, place because it's connected without uh, with uh, uh, the the, uh, the 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 world of uh, us and the words of the, the the people who is already die is in the so you have place for the um, for the people who is um, is living and uh, the place of people who already die so it's very spiritual and uh, people make some cultural practice inside the the houses so this make this uh, architecture very specific architecture is not just for living, but is also spiritual architecture. So we will talk about this. Next. Next slide, please. Okay. So uh, the use, as I was saying in the, in the beginning of my presentation, they use the local materials to, to build this uh, uh, some years ago they use local materials to to build and uh, they use it with uh, traditional know-how you know, and this tra traditional know-how uh, uh, make a they, they make a transmission uh, from generation to generation uh, like as you can see is not one person who is going to build we we have uh, the principal uh, uh, Mason, but also the apprentice who, who is going to learn how to, to build this heritage. Uh, the man who you, you, you see is the principal Mason, but around, he, around him, he has some youth people who is learning how, uh, how they can use uh, the local materials to build these, uh, these houses. Next is. So uh, in the construction of uh, the Takenta, it's important to know that it's a community work. It's not uh, uh, one person work. So, but in this community, we have women, we have men, we have children, we have youth, and all of parts of community have his role in the construction. The woman is the lead, he's, he's, uh, he's come of for the, the the last step of the construction so to be living to 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 be living the woman has to come to make a, a finishing to make um uh decoration to also uh, make use uh, uh, uh vegetal uh, and uh, animal materials to to make aesthetical of uh, all the the building as you can see on the on the picture this woman is going to make a, a finishing work about the takenta after this work we the, the takenta will be uh, uh, functional yes next so as i was saying for the stability and uh, aesthetic, and also for another reason, uh, they use uh, vegetal materials. They use uh, the vegetal materials uh, depend the step of construction. So you can see on the picture that they, they are using uh, some of, um, uh, it's come from uh, some uh, tree, is um, uh, is fruit. Yes, it's fruit from some, some tree, and they, they use it to, to make um, painting, painting of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the Takenta. So this is only uh, the step where they use power. They use energizers because they, they, they have to use uh, uh, the power to, to, uh, to have this, this, uh, this water. This is only the step they need to use energizers is important because I will talk about how this uh, building don't use energy. 
Next, please. So you can see some of uh, these uh, local materials. Who is uh, Biosuse? And uh, he's from natural, uh, like water, like uh, uh, la terre, you see? soil, and uh, also vegetal, like um, the fruits I show, like uh, uh, raffia, kenaf, and uh, uh, the, the vegetal, the, the, uh, uh, the, some materials come from agriculture. When we finish to, uh, they finish to, to, to work, uh, uh, they use some um, strash from uh, agriculture, like you, as you can see on the, yes, to, yes, to, 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 to wheels. Okay, next, please. So after this, you use this, all these materials, you can see that they, find, they, they get this beautiful and uh, very high ecological houses. You know, they use all is natural, all is local, all is uh, around the community, and they can build uh, these uh, uh, exceptional, uh, uh, exceptional houses. So, what we can learn uh, from from all this traditional know-how, all these materials, well, what we can learn for the modern architecture. Next, please. So uh, they they teach us that it's very important to use ex, to use the the, the 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 natural materials. They teach us it's very important to respect um, uh, our uh, environment. They also teach us that we don't need a lot of uh, energizers to make uh, air conditional. It's bioclimatical, you know, because in Africa we don't have a lot of power we know africa is uh, the the continent who uh, we don't have uh, uh, electricity you know when we have a map of all electricity in the world you can see that in africa is 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 small is small electricity so we don't need to build uh, the the houses who we is going to use more electricity for the air conditioner because it's hot at this place. So we need this building to have a bioclimatical, uh, bioclimatical houses. And uh, in, in the, uh, about the comfort, you know that modern materials can, can be very dangerous about the health, about cancer, about, but with this building, we have, Natural, natural materials and the air conditioner in the houses is very, 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 very good for the health. You know. Next slide, please. Yes. So, and also we, we can learn, we can learn the design. You can see that it's very high design. It's very high design. You can also like the design. We can also like the orientation of the, the, the houses. We can also learn uh, organization of some parts of the houses, but is very, uh, is, it can help the modern architect to be more innovative. They can learn a lot of things about these, uh, these uh, houses. Next. So how about resilience? Resilience. The resilience for me is mean that it, we have capacity to adaptation. We have also capacity to, uh, uh, to resolve the problem who is who is come to resolve this problem we also need to improve the uh, economical situation of the community you know and we can use all this traditional know-how to improve the the local uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the social economic because we can like create some uh, new materials, ecological materials, who can be selling on the market, and local people can can earn money to uh, to um, to use this for the the preservation and the conservation of this uh, this heritage. It's very important to uh, improve the the the, the statue of uh, so social economic of the, of this community. And the hen. Uh, I'm going to say thank you for your attention. And uh, you can see that uh, 
uh, is very, very beautiful place. And I invite all of you to one day visit this place and visit these houses. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Ibrahim. Um, I think we're all rushing to take you up on that offer. It looks absolutely wonderful. Um, if you want to hear more from Ibrahim, we have another event tomorrow at 5.15 in the Resilience Hub. So when we will have a little bit longer to, to hear from you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hand now to Rosie Poole, um, Architect and Director of Masons Inc. in India. And Rosie, over to you. Thank you so much, Hannah. And uh, it's my pleasure to speak after Ibrahim. It was such an exciting presentation. And it's interesting because um, I have the same things to talk about. And um, it's nice to know that no matter where we're from, it, we still have the same solutions or the same suggestions to the common problem we're all facing as, as the world. Now, when we talk about lessons that we learn from the vernacular, I think um, they're quite evident the lessons that are already present. When we talk about vernacular architecture, we already are talking about resilient buildings because they've lasted so many years. Of course, there are changes now because the climate is getting harsher and there are innovations that we need to make to our existing knowledge systems. But it does not mean that we forget and look for new inventions, but we look into what we already have and innovate on them. So when we speak about vernacular, like Ibrahim said, I think the vernacular talks a lot about how we're connected to our climate and our culture. And not only that, our, our culture is also um, has a say on the livelihood and the architecture of, of the place is depending on what they um, work on in that area. So some examples that I have, I don't have the beautiful slides, but I hope I can um, explain them well enough that you may understand. So when we talk about how, how closely culture and climate are linked to the vernacular, I'd like to speak about an example from Kerala, where the vernacular houses have large verandas, which, which are stepped verandas. So Kerala is a place with very heavy rainfalls and prone to flooding earlier occasional flooding, now flooding every year. So the idea of these stepped verandas was that there's enough of a level difference between the ground and the main house. So this veranda kind of acts as the area which could get flooded without really affecting the main structure. When it came to culture, the, the relevance of this was most of these houses were on riverbanks and they acted as places of rest for weary travelers who were coming by boat to just rest for the evening and then carry on you know, without disturbing the people of the house. And um, even when we move further north to the east of India, we have uh, a community near the Sundarbans where uh, they are a fishing community. So each community had um, some natural ponds that they were looking after and they, 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 they got their fish from there. And their houses were built from the clay from those ponds. And those areas, there is a lot of bamboo that's available. And the main structure was made out of bamboo and the, the infill material was this clay. And their idea of resilience is very different from what we imagine right now. Because right now we're looking at something you know, permanent, something of permanence that is a cure-all for everything, that one material that has the answer to all, all the problems in the world. But um, for them, it was more of renewal. So every year they, they are prone to cyclonic storms, but how they handled it was they, they would let the storm pass and the materials they needed to repair their houses were very local. So the intervention didn't cost them much to redo and repair the, the damages that the houses cost. And I think that's something that we really need to look into when we talk about resilience, because there is, it is a problem that we are creating when we give them solutions with materials that do not exist in their environment. Um, another lesson that I'd like to talk about is something that Ibrahim also touched upon is about how people-centric the vernacular was and is and how inclusive it is. It included children, it included women, it included men. And it was, it was a community affair to build something together. So of course, in urban areas, that might be difficult because we've come, of, we've come away from that um, self, uh, that feeling of being interdependent and we're looking 
into being more dependent, uh, independent. But in areas of rural landscapes, um, it is probably wrong to, to push this solution of independence on them when they are a community of interdependency. And uh, that's something that we need to think of when we're looking at solutions on in these um, climate sensitive areas. Um, the last thing I'd like to touch upon is the importance of materials and the, the, the wealth of knowledge that um, the indigenous communities have on each of the materials that they use. Ibrahim showed us some pictures of natural additives that, that were being added in, in the houses in Bena. And uh, it's interesting because there is the same kind of wealth of knowledge in, in, in India as well. And um, what is an additional thing that I found interesting was um, there is a transdisciplinary um, connection between these ingredients that were used. So again, talking about Kerala, the ingredients that were used in construction, um, these natural additives, very similar to the ones um, he spoke about, are also used in, in medicine, in Ayurveda and in, in neural art. So this one ingredient that, that has answers to your health, to your building, to your food, you know, and it's, it's something that, that we need to really look, look into where when you look at the built environment, you're not looking at it as a unidimensional um, um, aspect or a unidimensional element. And um, probably the answer is, um, in this case at least, Ayurveda is still a thriving, um, thriving uh, traditional practice. Uh, it's become very popular with the Western world and um, there's a still a lot happening over there, whereas the mural art and the architecture is in the revival phase. I mean, it's almost dying and we're trying to bring it back up. But one of the solutions we're looking at is to try and reconnect with the Ayurveda part of it so we can get our materials probably from there because it's the same materials, which would help us kind of give low carbon, uh, more place adaptive solutions to um, the resilient buildings that we are trying to build for these communities. So um, I'd like to end with that and thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rosie. That was um, wonderful. And that idea of connecting with more than just the buildings and the people and the places, but other aspects of people's lives, I think is is, is really important. Um, now I want to hand over to Sarah Sutton, uh, CEO of Environmental and Culture Partners um, in the US. Thank you. You know, everyone, we've only just met, yet our stories are so similar. I find it very rewarding to be having this conversation. So in the US, there are about 15,000 museums and historic sites. And we're only just learn relearning how to use the 18th, 19th, and early 20th sites in the way they were intended, opening up portions of the structures in ways that create airflow, like Ibrahim was talking about in his buildings, in order to make them more comfortable. So for example, Lindhurst, owned by the National Trust in New York, and Vizcaya, owned by the city of Miami, are both working on projects to reopen internal air tubes, which were designed to create a natural airflow through the building that have been shuttered for decades. And even most people have forgotten were there. So we're trying to figure out how to reuse our sites in the way that they were originally intended so that we can use artificial electricity, which America sometimes unfortunately has, um, so that we can reduce how much of that that we use. Uh, many of these, Museums are having to reconsider their museum practices. We've gotten so professional in our work that we shut down the buildings, we turn on the temperature and the humidity control, and we don't use the buildings as they're supposed to be used because we're protecting the objects within them. But that process damages the building. So we're trying to figure out how to relearn what our professional practice is. But sometimes the things we've done aren't working as well as we'd hoped. So we've got a situation in um, the Northwest. I mean, in, sorry, I live in the Northwest, but the focus is on the Southwest where we've got Adobe structures that people live in as regular homes now. Um, and they've installed modernized windows for energy efficiency that are suffering from wind imp impacts that come through increased climate driven storms. And the physical movement of those structures, those window structures are damaging to the historic structures. 
but we have less of the natural historic materials for repairing those structures. So that's another example of something we're going to have to change in the way we operate our buildings. But I feel I'm really pleased to say that we're finding some ways to revive some of the more vernacular approaches. I spent the last three years, luckily, living on the island of Oahu in the state of Hawaii, the most isolated inhabited archipelago in the world. I wasn't quite sure of that when I started, um, but I've noticed two things there. The restoration of hales, which are community uh, buildings for community discussion, community planning, discussions about how to deal with social issues such as climate change. All local materials, open-sided buildings designed to be much more resilient in the face of storms and something where they're restoring the public practice of how to build and use these buildings. And then my favorite one is fish ponds, and you mentioned one. So in Hawaii, they're called, let me get this right, loco kuapa. And they are five different types of fish ponds. I'll just tell you about one right on the ocean, which built into the coral reef. It's called Heea fish pond, uh, 800 years old, 60 acres of sustainable food harvesting for a community that also acts as a natural buffer against storm events coming up upon the island. An ancient approach that's now being revived that gives us confidence that all of these resources can help us address climate action and keep our community safe. So I have lots of reasons for courage and inspiration in this work. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so we're going to think about carbon next, um, and I am going to hand over to um, my colleague Adala Leeson at Historic England. Um, I feel a long way from home at the moment, Adala, so it's good to see your face. Um, um, and uh, questions about how does all this vernacular knowledge and historic built environment help with addressing carbon mitigation? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. My name's Adala Leeson, and I'm Head of Socioeconomic Analysis and Evaluation at Historic England. And thank you for the question, Hannah. I think all the examples we've seen thus far are really demonstrating that we're all sort of aiming towards the same goals, which is to reduce carbon, to consider people and uh, the health and um, the, of, of people, as well as think about our economy. So, those are kind of the three key areas that um, we currently look at the historic environment and the lens of the social, the economic and environmental impact. And as far as carbon goes, one of the really critical things, I'll talk about two things. I know I don't have much time. I'll talk about two things. One is about the durability of our historic environment. And the second is this real issue we have facing us about information and information asymmetries. Um, so I'm lucky enough to live in England and do a lot of research here, looking at our historic, our very, very rich historic environment, championing our historic environment. And what we see is we have amazing buildings that are still standing that were built 900, 500, 200 years ago. So in fact, 21% of all homes in England are over 100 years old. And when we talk about sustainability, surely this is what we're really talking about, is that intergenerationality. We were talking about the multidimensionality of these issues and interdisciplinary nature, but it's that intergenerationality of what we have. It's the richness of that and the fact that we have seen our forefathers living in these spaces, being provided by shelter, living space, working space, in these in these places and it's that where it becomes really critical for us to start thinking in the long in the long term about the holistic picture about what is it we measure what is it we talk about when we talk about reducing carbon emissions within the built historic environment and the built environment more generally is that we need to be considering that the buildings we have have been through all these generations and continue to provide us with those much, much needed spaces. And they can continue to provide us with those spaces and the new generation and the generations after that, as well as the new build is really taking into consideration the issues that we've just discussed around materials, uh, low carbon materials, and ensuring that those materials are durable, are fit for purpose in the environments that they are. And our research is really now 
kind of pushing for us to have this much better, much more holistic understanding of what constitutes carbon within the built environment. And so to date, I argue that we have experienced significant market failure because we tend to focus on very narrow aspects of carbon in the built environment. And it's really that thing around the in-use carbon produced by building, which is a huge carbon emitter. But it's really, really critical that we start moving beyond just looking at the operational aspects towards looking at the embodied carbon of the built in historic of the built environment, which means that we look at more widely the life cycle of building when we extract materials, when we transport materials, when we manufacture materials for building. All those things really, really do matter. And what our research has found is that up to a third of Uh, um, the carbon emitted by a new home of 50 years is emitted through embodied emissions. So when we tend, so in our, in our, um, we tend to look at the historic environment as a problem. It's often um, framed as a problem, but actually that is because we're only looking at a narrow set of measures. We're only measuring the operational emissions, when you actually bring into account the whole picture, and that is international and territorial emissions, then you start to see a very different picture emerging, which has very significant consequences for the decisions you make. So what we found a standard Victorian terrace home in England is, is produces less carbon over 50 years, only when you consider the embodied carbon of producing new things. So it's really important for us, and we know that we can reduce uh, carbon emissions in historic buildings, but we also know that it has to be done uh, well. Um, Otherwise, there are huge risks of maladaptation. You have to take into consideration the materials that these buildings and how they were made to function. And that's also a key area for us is that there are real issues about information and how we Um, apply modern techniques, modern technology, um, modern measures to to traditionally built buildings that were built quite differently. So what we want is also to think about bespoke measures, a bespoke understanding of these assets, because they are so rich, they can provide us with so much space. And I think what we need to always think about is that these are things we are borrowing from future generations. So it's repairing and maintaining and ensuring that is a really critical part of your net zero objective for the built environment. It's also to increase the durability of those assets. So I think what we're coming with is that this idea of durability and measuring the right thing is really critical for our future. Right. Thanks, Adala. Um, I think that's a fantastic um, introduction to to Laurie. Um, Laurie Ferris, um, I'm going to hand to you next. All right. Thanks, Hannah. It's such an honor to be here with all these amazing speakers. Um, I'm Laurie Ferris from Boston in the United States. I'm an an architect and conservator and really an advocate and champion for building reuse of climate action. So uh, to pick up on what Adala was just saying, um, I want to follow on this life cycle, the idea of the life cycle carbon emissions and environmental impacts of buildings. I wanna tie that to the idea of the time value of carbon. And you know, as we all know, we, we don't have the luxury of getting to net zero by the year 2050 now or over 50 years, the life cycle, the average life cycle of a building. We really need to be reducing carbon in the very near term. And this even furthers this point that um, we have this huge carbon investment that's been handed down to us in the form of our heritage landscape. Um, and the, the existing buildings, the existing back vernacular buildings that we already have and continue to use. Um, and so reusing these buildings is the most impactful embodied carbon reduction strategy, carbon saving strategy that results in near term reductions of carbon emissions in the built environment that we have available to us and can actually re- reusing a building rather than replacing it can actually reduce the carbon emissions, the embodied carbon emissions by 70 to 85 percent. Um, so this is really a strategy that we have to all we have to all really embrace, I think. Um, and beyond that, I think I'll just go back to some of the points that were made earlier about the fact that because these buildings were designed and constructed or, or continue to be designed and constructed in areas where um, energy is not as cheap and available as, as it is in developed parts of the world, um, 
we they were inherently made in ways that are gentler on the natural environment, less extractive. Uh, and so we have a lot of lessons to learn here. Um, one about, and maybe I'll talk about performance for first, operational performance, getting back to the idea of the energy we use to operate our buildings or those operational carbon emissions. Um, so when we think about, uh, we've seen some really lovely examples of this, buildings that were designed to be location specific and are designed to work with their local environment, not to overpower it and provide comfort at any cost. And they accomplish this through the use of passive design features or design moves that are climate responsive and maximize comfort for the people inside the building. Again, designing, going back to that concept of designing for people, maximize that comfort using um, those climate responsive um, traits like uh, we saw with the, the mass walls, which help things stay cooler in the summer or uh, shading at overhangs or porches or operable shutters on the exterior, or for example, architectural features like cupolas, which promote natural ventilation um, and bring heat up and out of a building. All of these keep buildings more comfortable without uh, air conditioning or heating, without using energy and, re and releasing carbon emissions. Um, we call these inherently sustainable features in the conservation community. Ironically, I'm starting to see a lot of these come back as high-tech sustainable sustainability strategies and we're really reinventing the wheel here. We have this opportunity to just learn from these approaches that have been around for centuries rather than have, having to you know, come up with them all over again as new solutions. And going back quickly to the idea of embodied carbon and the materials we use in buildings. Um, again, we've seen some really wonderful examples of how local materials that are made through craftsmanship and through um, you know, working with other local industries such as medicine and agriculture, can lead to materials that are most, both more durable, perform better, are more resilient, um, and also have a much lower carbon footprint. Uh, and maybe I'll just focus on insulation as one example of um, in the developed world, we tend to use petroleum-based foams to insulate our buildings to make them have a, a better performing thermal envelope. These both have a very high carbon footprint and they're also toxic to people, to the people who install them and to the people who live in these buildings. Uh, and we can contrast that to something like a thatched roof, which has very high insulative properties, but is uh, harnesses the power of plants, which are again, local, they're rapidly renewable, they tie to agricultural practices, um, and they are, uh, as we saw, adaptable because they can be replaced over time and maintained. Um, and Thank I'll you. end I'm with- Sorry, Laurie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Have I gone on too long? It's okay. I've just, uh, we have we have to cut off um, okay. at, at the very end. So thank Can I leave you. One, one thought. To, yes. <laughs> oh, I just, just want to iterate re, uh, durability, which is that we cannot continue the throwaway culture of buildings. It's all about reuse and extending the life of buildings. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Sorry to interrupt your final no point problem. there. Um, I'm going to hand now to uh, Lana in um, Slovenia, Lana Nastia Anzo. I hope I pronounced it, your name okay. <laughs> Lana, over to you. It's quite, it's quite uh, right. So um, I, I think many things have already been said and I'll try to make it very um, quick. And I'll just present um, basically a case study from my um, home environment, which is uh, the Karst region in uh, Slovenia. And um, a very uh, uh, a big specific of this region is that it's very kind of ro rocky. There is not, uh, um, and there is not a lot of, uh, for example, woods and so on. Um, it's basically quite um, a plain. And of course, people in the past uh, adapted to this um, by uh, making use of um, this uh, limestone that was um, in abundance in um, the their natural environment. Um, so basically that's how um, the dry stone walling um, became one of the traditional techniques for the construction. But especially after the second world war, it uh, kind of gradually um, decreased um, in use because people um, turned to uh, to the use of prefabricated houses and also um, in that time um, maybe the traditional was not uh, anymore something that was very appealing to um, to people but this kind of changed in the last um, approximately five years because um, there was a, 
um, multinational um, nomination for uh, registering dry stone walling as a UNESCO uh, UNESCO uh, recognized um, uh, heritage. And um, there was established a partnership for Karsik um, dry stone walling. And this basically a community of uh, people started with a lot of local projects and it gained so much pop popularity that basically um, even the county recognized um, this value of the, <clears throat> of the traditional dry stone walling. And what they did was they um, created basically a decree uh, which states that any kind of um, construction that is either um, a, a wall or a supporting wall or a, plot, a border a plot wall and, and so on, or even a facade or roof needs to be done in this um, dry stone wall technique. And how is this all related to the carbon emissions. First of all, because dry stone, dry stone wall uses as a material, the stone that it's basically located in the area, there is basically no transportation cost, especially comparing it to prefabricated houses, which sometimes can be imported from as far as um, other, other continents. Um, and on the other hand, um, with dry stone wall, you don't use a mortar or concrete. So basically after, um, after the building is not serving it, its purpose anymore, you can literally just transport it stone by stone to another location and use it for another building. And actually you can uh, observe this process in this particular area going on for more than 3000 years because in in the in the area uh, there are a lot of remains from the bronze age fortresses um, and th they th those um, those um, buildings were made made of course also in the dry stone technique and people in the past would just go to those um, to the to those places where the fortresses are pick up like um, the needed amount of stones and transport it on their um, either um, plot to create a, um, a plot or the wall, or maybe they took it to where they were building their, their house and, and so on. And especially, um, and, and today this is um, this practice of kind of um, literally transporting the, the part of the construction to another location is especially used with the roofing because um, there is like a sub area of dry st stone walling which is used specifically for the roofs. And even if you search, for example, um, on the websites when, where you can uh, buy like second, second hand, so to speak, uh, items, you can literally buy just roof because um, people are selling like the, the roofs of the old houses. So, so basically anyone who's like um, reconstructing or rebuilding their like um, old country home and wants to do it like in a proper way would buy uh, the, the roof from, from another, but probably very close location um, and transport it to, um, to basically their, their house or where, where they're building. So um, I think that's like a, a nice example of my, micro case study mm -hmm. of how the heritage can be used um, in ways of uh, recycling and um, lowering the transportation um, carbon dioxide costs. Thank you Thank very you. much. <laughs> Thank you, Lana. Um, we're going to go to Argentina now, uh, to Mar Mauro Garcia Santa Cruz. Um, over to you, Mauro. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this important event. I'm an architect and also coordinate the Heritage and Climate Change Initiative, which is a member of Climate Heritage Network. To illustrate my participation, we select some case studies and published some images of those heritage buildings on our social networks. You can find them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter with the hashtag Sustainable Heritage Forum. 
I lived in the city of La Plata, which is the capital of the province of Buenos Aires in Argentina. The city was planned from scratch and founded in 1882. From that time until the end of the 19th century, the main government buildings of the province were built. The Cathedral of La Plata City was also built, a magnificent neo-Gothic building with bricks that were manufactured in the same city. During the last decade of the 20th century, this heritage building was restored. A technological adaptation of all, of all its facilities was made and the construction of its main towers was completed. The other case is the Post and Telecommunications Palace built at the end of the 19th century in the city of Buenos Aires, capital of Argentina. This building, inspired by the French academicism, was the headquarters of the central post office until the beginning of the 21st century. At that time, the federal government made the decision to refurbish it as a cultural center, as part of the celebrations for the bicentennial of the countries in of the country's independence. Between 2010 and 2015, the restoration and refurbishment works of the building was carried out. These works include the restoration of the facades of the historical building and the interior spaces, the technological adaptation of all the facilities, as well as the construction of a concert hall and an exhibition space in the large central courtyard of the building. As you know, the buildings and construction sector is a major source of greenhouse gas emissions. Restoration and retrofitting of heritage buildings are key strategies in mitigating climate change, mainly by the embodied carbon stored in building materials, but also for the architectural strategies used in its designs, the incorporation of environmentally friendly measures the nobility of the materials used and their great durability. We must not forget that the buildings presented are more than a hundred years old. They are still in use and will continue to do so far many more decades. As we have seen, these buildings can be refurbished and those start a new life cycle. For these reasons, we consider that the protection of cultural heritage can mitigate the effects of climate change while working towards the sustainable development of their communities. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mauro. Um, we're going to go to Thailand now, to Warathida uh, Chiapaya um, in Chiang Mai. Warathida. Uh, thank you and hello, everyone. Uh, greeting from Chiang Mai, Thailand. Uh, my name is Dr. Waratida Shayapa. I'm the Assistant Director of Chiang Mai University uh, School of Public Policy. Uh, today, I'm very happy to uh, provide you information about our project that we are doing together with the Fraunhofer, the research institute from Germany. Uh, this project is called CHARMS, uh, which is the short name, or you can say it is a, a nickname of the very long name project. Carrying heritage building as part of urban regions into a modern and energy efficiency society. So, in a nutshell, what we try to do is to conserve the vernacular architecture in our Chiang Mai city. Um, that is the Lana traditional wooden house. We regard it as the origin ordinary cultural heritage. And you can see that. Uh, more and more the number of the Lana traditional wooden house in Chiang Mai is decreasing. It was replaced by the modern house uh, built by the modern materials such as concrete. Why we call it the uh, wooden house as a uh, ordinary cultural heritage of our city? Uh, because these wooden houses tell us the history of our city. Uh, back to the time that we have the colonial forest concession in 1897, uh, to the time that we have the first train railway, the railway uh, construction connecting Bangkok to Chiang Mai in 1927 and so on. So 
uh, these wooden houses are with us, have been with us uh, for many years, over 120 years, and the design, the architecture reflect the major incidents in our history. Um, this charms project, we have together four years of the art and D phase. Uh, we start already in July 2021 until uh, June 2025. The objective of our Charms project is to find adaptation strategies so that this old wooden house in Chiang Mai can continue, can last uh, in the modern and energy efficiency society. Uh, we don't have the solutions yet because we just start our project, but today I'd like to draw your attention to the major challenges that the wooden houses in Chiang Mai are facing. The first one, the first major challenge is the thermal comfort within the wooden house. Due to the global warming, urbanization, uh, rapid uh, high rise building construction, this obstruct the natural flow of the wind and also the uh, natural ventilation that the wooden house rely on. So that's why the residents in the wooden house complain the same thing that it's so hot to live inside the wooden house. The second major uh, challenge that face the wooden house is to have very high energy consumption. If you can think about the wooden house in the hot uh, summer of Thailand, uh, people have to install air conditioning inside a house, but unfortunately, because of the house is not completely sealed. That's why we have the problem of cool leak, cool air leak out of the house, and that caused high electricity bill, uh, which is the an eco economic burden for the residents. The third one, which is very severe, um, Chiang Mai, uh, we are not so proud of this rank, but in 2019, we were ranked number one in terms of uh, PM 2.5 pollution uh, in the world. Um, if, if you can see the picture from the left hand side, uh, that one is our mountain, the, the provincial, the, the, the holy mountain of Chiang Mai or Dar Sutep mountain. And in the clear blue sky there, you can see it very clearly from the very far distance. But once we have the hair season, uh, which come to uh, our city every year during January to April, you can't see that mountain anymore. It just disappeared. Um, so the air quality indoor and outdoor of the wooden house are the same in that period. Uh, you can imagine that people cannot uh, feel secure at all to live inside the wooden house once we have the PM 2.5 pollution uh, in our city. Uh, we have a lot of data and the record that we have increased of the number of patients of lung cancer uh, in our city. Apart from these three challenges, I like to add very um, concerning factor that uh, wooden house are um, experiencing is about changing perception of people. It turned out that people, especially young generation, regard living in a wooden house as a burden because of the high maintenance costs. If they inherit the wooden house from their parents or their grandparents, they would rather tear it down and replace it with the modern houses built by concrete. The poor people usually live in the wooden house. If they have more money, they will just replace it with the modern house as you can see from the picture. Another concerning factor is that the house is not valuable in their opinion, but the land itself, the land where the house is located on is very valuable. And the owner is prone to sell it to the businessman who can replace it, uh, this house with modern uh, restaurant or you know, guest house, et cetera. Uh, again, uh, we try to address all of that, uh, those problems that I raised. Um, for example, what we try to do during these four years of R&D is to find a way to retrofitting houses so that it can increase the thermal comfort for the residents, uh, protect the residents from the PM 2.5 pollution, and at the same time, try to find a technology that is suitable 
for the wooden house to enhance its energy efficiency. If we succeed all of this, we hope that we can change the mindset of people to save this wooden house as a cultural heritage and livable for them in the 21st century. So Thank if you. you guys have comments or anything, please reach me through this email in the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Theda. Um, we are very short on time, so I'm going to hang over to Irem. Um, apologies, Irem, for leaving you with the last word. Maybe that's an advantage. No, Thank it's you. Okay, I'm going to make a brief summary. Actually, I was going to talk about vernacular houses, and I'm going to sorry, just share my screen. Uh, I have some brief examples to show you, and I'll make a brief summary actually of what was uh, said today. Uh, so. Residential buildings actually make up the majority of our built environment and vernacular houses also constitute a great amount. And vernacular houses are the manifestation of both tangible and intangible assets of many diverse cultures, combining traditional construction techniques and local materials, which represent a morphological response to environmental conditions, socioeconomic and cultural characters of societies. Vernacular houses are built with locally available building materials, as was stressed many times today. Stone, earth, wood, lime, to name some of them. These materials have less carbon prints, as we have uh, seen today also in the carbon session, than many other building materials, and they produce less environmental damage during their extraction, their production, and also transportation phase. They're also reusable and recyclable materials, which is good for the environment. And also revival of traditional building techniques is important for the future of our settlements. For example, lime slaking instead of using lime uh, and using lime mortar instead of using cement mortar when building a stone wall or cladding timber walls is, uh, has many ecological benefits because we use natural friendly materials in the first case. Also, we use physically and uh, chemically compatible materials together. Lime works well with timber and stone. So this is also makes buildings structurally durable and it also provides better insulation than cement or concrete. So for the future, what can we say? The passing of this traditional building knowledge is important. This is through oral traditions, storytelling, myths, etc., and also mostly through uh, hands-on practice, practicing together, as we have seen examples today, master and apprentice uh, practicing together is important. This also brings to uh, the picture voluntary and collaborative work and also collective work in a society in preparation of the site before construction, preparation of building materials, for example, adobe brick building or cutting uh, timber from the woods. All of these actions also enhance collaborative spirit in the societies and contribute greatly to social resilience. The historic settlements, uh, mostly made up of vernacular houses, are clusters of vernacular buildings in harmony with their surrounding topography and also with the local climate. They are more pedestrian and less car oriented than uh, many new cities, and they are more compact and dense settlements, therefore have less carbon emissions than new cities. So uh, to wrap up, Briefly, preservation of vernacular houses and settlements includes sustaining traditional livelihoods and building practices, supporting therefore social and economic dimensions of sustainability. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Irem. And thank you to all our speakers today. I think that was a, a whistle-stop tour through everything that we have to offer from, from our um, knowledge of vernacular and historic built environments. So, um, I wish you all luck in work with these projects. I think it's it's very important that we we share this and continue to to work together and and find these common common grounds. So thank you ever so much.